Uh, thank you for letting me join. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and, and talk over it a bit. Um, I want to um, I want to just again just reiterate my thanks. Uh, you know, it, it's a pleasure for me to be part of an international conversation. I've had a chance to engage with cities um, in different parts of the world, and it's always striking to me how much there are similarities in the kind of challenges that we face in navigating our own bureaucracies to to, to try and get things done for for the residents and for our neighbors. And so, always being part of uh, international conversations is, is, um, is, 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 I feel fortunate to be able to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what New York City is doing around inequality, particularly around poverty. Um, and that's because of my vantage uh, in New York City government. I run the, um, the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. And we have uh, the mission to help the city of New York use evidence and innovation to reduce poverty and to advance equity. We're an office of about 65 people, a budget of about 60 million US dollars uh, per year. Um, but it's important to recognize that New York City government as a whole is very big. You know, when, when you include all the teachers and um, police officers and et cetera, you get over 300,000 people. Um, so we're a small part of even the mayor's office. Um, and so our aim in the way we work is to work across agencies um, to support the work of uh, our city colleagues who are delivering social services, who are working on child welfare, criminal justice, across the range of goals on these sort of mutually reinforcing strategies. One is just to promote and lift up what works um, so that the policymakers can make better decisions. The second is to focus on the experience that New York City residents are having when they're engaging with our social services and work to make that uh, the city be more coordinated and effective and, and particularly technology enabled. And to generate research so that we have a better understanding of social conditions um, and can respond um, more effectively to issues of poverty and equity. Um, we just very briefly have a multidisciplinary team um, and the kinds of work that we do um, focuses especially on doing pilot programs, doing the kind of experimentation that, that we heard from our last speaker, um, doing formal evaluations, using human-centered and user-driven design so that we can work with the folks who are closest to the problems to understand broader perspectives about potential solutions and reporting on existing social conditions. We have a multidisciplinary team. And the office was set up in this way in particular because the issues of poverty and inequality are so multifaceted and cut across so many different agencies, which in our city government, and, and I know many around the world, are particularly siloed. And so when dealing with multifaceted issues, it's, um, we try to serve as a coordinating entity that can tie together um, different complementary work of our different agencies. It's also helpful, I think, for us to be explicitly organized as an innovation lab. Often in government, um, there's a, a, a fear of risk taking because the public, it's so public facing, failures it can be so damaging politically. So having a unit that's explicitly um, set up to take risks allows government to fail without, without such um, you know, perceived devastating consequences and it allows us to try new things. So I, I, you know, one of the ways as we think about ways that local localities can address inequalities is to think about having capacities like ours. We've certainly borrowed from um, the way other municipalities use data and um, human-centered design. Um, we've seen the way our office is replicated in other uh, cities. Um, and we are at a moment, particularly you know, in the US, in New York City, where potentially transformative change is possible. Um, uh, I, I don't know how closely you're following the election but um, here, but it looks like we're going to have a new president, which opens new possibilities. 
Um, we've got an increased consciousness about disparities and racial disparities. We have an economic crisis, um, and, and that's during a period where uh, we have a newer appreciation of essential workers. And in the midst of the economic crisis, we've had millions more folks trying to access public services um, who haven't before and so potentially have um, a greater empathy for others who try to access public services and see the challenges of doing so. So all these are very big problems, they're big, big challenges. Uh, we have a long way to go to get out of them. But what gives me a bit of hope in the moment is to know that these were all challenges that were, aside from COVID, the underlying challenges were in place a year ago, but it was before we had this um, increased attention to the, and, and recognition of disparities. It was before we had this appreciation of low wage workers um, and before we had the reckoning being driven um, by the Black Lives Matter movement. So it is potentially a time for change. Um, when we look at uh, issues of income inequality in New York City, there's a couple of key pillars that from my perspective can help guide what cities do. Uh, and I'll run through them and then, and then walk through different examples from New York City. One is applying the equity lens to all of our work in governance. And when I say equity, it's about thinking that one's personal identity whether that's race, gender identity, income, sexual orientation, should not predict life outcomes. And too often right now, we can predict um, life outcomes based on those characteristics. So taking an equity lens to say, what do we need to do to make that not the case? And embedding it into all aspects of government. So it's not a separate stream of work. It's central to our agenda and it's fully integrated into our systems of accountability and performance management. Second, to do that, measuring and reporting on disparities, disaggregating data so we can identify what those disparities are to address them. Doing what works sounds so simple. Everybody agrees in principle, do what works, follow evidence. But in practice, evidence-based policymaking is difficult. It takes a willingness to embrace accountability, defy political constituencies sometimes when things don't work, discovering what works, which can be a complicated process, not always clear. Even if we are doing things that are rooted in evidence, making them work is also a challenge. Getting better outcomes requires discipline of management, of implementation, of, of really drawing on the experiences of residents. And finally, thinking about the kind of transformational change or structural change that we heard about in the last speaker is sometimes within the power of cities um, and sometimes not. But there are things cities can do to push for broader um, um, transformation that has to be driven at the national level. So equity lens and everything, just a few uh, examples in each of these items. One is long-term planning. In New York City, we have a long-term strategy. It's called One New York City. Um, and where we've explicitly integrated different visions for um, the economy, for sustainability, for um, economic growth and said that equity needs to be a part of all of those things. So the initiatives and visioning that we did um, across government and across residents is rooted in the, in the interconnections among these um, different strands of work. And in order to bake equity into the way that government holds itself accountable, we've required uh, every single agency um, to examine its own practices and look for opportunities to reduce inequalities and to produce an action plan that spells out what they're gonna do by when. So for example, the child welfare agency in the city looks at investigations of child mistreatment. And if it sees that families of black or black children um, are not getting the same level of services, but instead uh, more punitive measures. They are taking um, 
adjustments to push out more services to black communities, to train staff, to try and reduce the disparities um, that might exist in how families experience the child welfare system. Equity action plans and assessments is something that we're doing in New York, and it's something that is taking hold um, across U.S. cities more and more. In order to do equity analysis, the basics of measuring and reporting disparities is critical. So often in local government, um, we look only at a top line measure and not at what's going on in different populations. So in New York City, one example is on child mor uh, infant mortality, where overall the trend has been positive. But when we disaggregate by race, we see that um, black families have three times the rate of uh, infant mortality. And so that's led to new initiatives around maternal health, new partnerships uh, with public hospitals. Often we don't have the data that we want. Um, and so uh, our office works to produce reports that looks at social indicators, specifically disaggregates by various factors that I mentioned, race, gender identity, et cetera. Um, and where we don't have the data works with agencies to begin to collect it. We do the same around poverty. Um, and the focus on disparities has, of course, been a big uh, area when tracking the impact of COVID. When we think about doing what works in addressing poverty and its related challenges, we think about it in these three buckets. One is about money. Poverty specifically is about whether folks have um, more resources than, than, their, than the need in order to meet their needs. And there's two ways to affect that, either to increase the resources or to reduce expenses. And so issues around wage policy, tax policy, access to benefits are all on the positive side. And the subsidies uh, on non-discretionary expenses are other strategies that we looked at. Second bucket, looking specifically at folks who we know are vulnerable to falling into poverty without um, intervention um, and, and delivering on-time support that can help. So for example, for people who are at risk of falling into homelessness, providing legal services to fight evictions, to provide emergency cash to pay rent, mental health supports are things that um, we made increased investments in over, over the past five years. Last bucket, um, focusing on human capital, building earning potential, investing in education, early childhood, um, retraining, upskilling, things that allow people to um, have the capacity to earn more over their lifetimes. Three examples of where those ideas come from. One, um, sometimes we replicate ideas that do emerge as an experiment. So um, Jobs Plus is an example. In this instance, a research firm created a demonstration project that work to help people living in public housing access employment opportunities. Um, it uh, hired local residents to engage their neighbors, provide personal support, opened offices in public housing, showed promise. New York City saw that research, started the project um, in the city and have found similarly good results and scaled it up. Second example is the City University of New York is a local public university system, and it can be a platform for economic mobility. Many of the students who um, attend CUNY are the first in their family to go to college, but historically the graduation rate has been very low. Uh, at the chancellor at the time um, made the case that um, we could combine a number of different supports, funds for books, funds for commuting, putting students in supportive cohorts, offering personalized advice, a set of things that not on its own were innovative, but had never been packed fully together. Um, we tested it with 1,000 students, it doubled the graduation rate, and we're now scaled it up to reach 25,000 students in New York City, and the program's been replicated um, outside of the city as well. And finally, thinking about applying lessons system-wide. Um, our current mayor, de Blasio, 
uh, one of the signature initiatives is implementing pre-kindergarten universally for all four-year-olds, which prior uh, to his taking office um, wasn't uh, available. Um, but at the same time as scaling up the service, we also implemented important quality metrics because the service on its own isn't likely to develop the intended benefits unless it's at quality with well-trained teachers with accountability. And so those parts have been uh, part of the process of scaling up the model. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got two more slides. I know I'm at okay. time. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, okay. uh, maybe we can uh, rush through them. And I'll rush through. My la uh, second to last point is just doing what works isn't enough. You need to do things well. Um, the performance, uh, performance management, evaluation, human-centered design, behavioral science, doing digital services, all of these things um, could be better and more broadly reflected in, in local government. And finally, I would just say, you know, cities can't do it all. Um, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the social conditions where, the, where um, change happens at the population level is driven by national policies. The chart on the left shows the ways that in New York City, our poverty rate is affected by national policies around housing supports, around um, cash payments to seniors, nutritional supports. Things that really move the needle are often policies made um, at a broader level, but there is plenty, and this is my last point, that cities can do on their own. We do have power over affordable housing policies, not just funding, but also zoning. We have power over criminal justice policies, our own environmental practices, how we police, um, uh, how we contract. And so there are big, important, change that cities can make, but it's not easy and it takes struggle. Mm -hmm.